is Bob Morris. I'm an associate provost for research and dean of the graduate school. I'm very pleased to welcome you to our annual Outstanding Researcher and Creating Endeavor Awardee of the Year Awards and Lectures. These awards recognize the first rate efforts of faculty in their research and creative endeavors, and each of them are chosen by the, not by the university administration, but instead they are nominated by their peers and selected by the University Research and Creative Arts Committee. <laughs> this year's outstanding research of the year is Tom Holtgrave, Professor of Psychology, Cabinet of Trump. And this year's Creative Endeavor Awardee is Matt Mullins, Associate Professor of English, over here to my right. And I'm sure afterwards you will agree with me that each of these folks are represent outstanding work that's happening across campus. Now, as, you, as with last year, I mean, if you were here last year, the sponsored programs office, along with the University Health Press, have created professional videos of each of these awardees. These full link videos are now available on the SPO website under a section that's called Spies with SPO in capital letters, and as well on the SPO YouTube channel. Yes, the sponsored programs office has a YouTube channel. I didn't even know that. I encourage each of you to view these videos in full and delve a bit deeper into each awardee's background and their interests and motivations. In addition, the video team created introductory videos uh, for this event. So we'll first show Professor Fulgrave's video, followed by his lecture and brief, uh, brief Q&A. And then Dr. Mullen's video will be shown, and then he will present and have Q&A. Afterwards, there'll be an opportunity to mingle and enjoy some snacks after the event. Does that happen? Right here. So feel please, uh, please feel free to stick around and enjoy the opportunity to network and get to know these outstanding faculty members. Now, before we get started, I want to take just a moment uh, to help us think about the similarities and distinctions between research and creative endeavors. So. I looked up each of our awardees and compared their statements on their web page. One of them writes, my primary research program investigates social psychological factors involved in the production and comprehension of language. While the other one writes, my areas of interest and expertise are focused around creative writing, screenwriting, poetry fiction, and digital electronic literature. Which one the hell Pretty similar. Sure. Then the other one writes, Current research examines language processing deficits in Parkinson's disease and the lateralization of speaker reading. Then the other one writes, my collection of short stories, Three Ways of the Song, is forthcoming from Atticus Books in early 2012. I published fiction and poetry in a variety of print and several online literary journals. I'm also currently working on a number of full-length screenplays. Well, that's a bit more distinguishing, I think you must admit. Now, one of them writes in part, one of them writes in part, I have additional interest in gambling and risk taking. We'll see if you can tell which one said that at the end of the day. And there's no cheating by looking at the comments, by the way. So with all that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Fulton's video and an absolute phenomenon that I, that I focus on, most of my research focuses on, is language, uh, because that's a, an interdisciplinary topic. Uh, there's, there's a neurological component, there's a, a cultural component, there's a social component, uh, and, and they're all connected. I got into psychology uh, as an undergraduate because it's just, it's, it was just fascinating. Uh, it's intrinsically uh, an interesting topic, and that has never wavered. Uh, it, I'm still interested in it. And, be able to study what you're interested in. It doesn't it really doesn't get in there.
these days. Uh, here's another example of some, and some is a quantifier, so there's variability in terms of, of what it means. Uh, so in this case, uh, we've, got, we've got a little bit of miscommunication uh, in terms of, of how many people some uh, refers to. Jer Jeremy thinks it's uh, quite a few, his parents uh, considerably less. Okay, how to save face, this is, I don't know if anybody reads, this is Arlo and Janice. This is actually fairly similar to a lot of the situations that we, uh, that we look at. So Arlo cooks something, he asks his wife for uh, uh, what she thinks, and she says uh, it's evocative. Uh, and of course, uh, Arlo pretty astutely figures out uh, she doesn't like it. So, uh, you know, the question is why, why does she say it that way? Why does she use what it, what it, a weasel word? Uh, and then how does Arlo get that meaning? What's the process involved in that? Um, okay, we've got an indirect, we've looked at a lot of requests. Uh, many times requests are relatively indirect. Uh, the request, I'm going to the store, would you like to come with me? Uh, and of course he uh, uh, stumbles a little bit, there's some processing going on and he finally realizes that it's not really a request, it is a, you are going with me. Um, so these are, and I got one more. Um, another thing we're interested in is uh, individual differences in the ability to uh, understand uh, ambiguous utterances. And so I'm sure many of you know the Big Bang Theory. Uh, uh, Sheldon, there was, there was a running gag that his, uh, he's uh, not able to detect sarcasm. Um, and so one of the things we're interested in, is, and sarcasm of course is a type of ambiguity, and we're interested in individual differences uh, in this ability to detect uh, sarcasm. So why, is, why, is ambi why does ambiguity exist? Why, does linguistic, uh, why is linguistic meaning uh, ambiguous? Why did language, human natural language evolve so that it allows for ambiguity? Uh, and of course there's many reasons. Uh, there are of course uh, aesthetic reasons, poetry for example. Uh, there is uh, the idea of manipulation. This is something that Steve, Steven Pinker's been writing about lately. Uh, the idea that it gi it, it, ambiguity gives people deniability. So you can say, be too bad if something happened to your store, right? Which of course in most contexts is a threat, but if you come back and, and claim that somebody was threatening, you just, you say, no, it wasn't, it was just too, be too bad. Uh, other examples of this that we see a lot are what are called dog whistle politics, where you use a word that some people 
have a particular interpretation of that maybe is negative, and if you uh, uh, confront them on it, not what I meant, right? So, but then the third reason is uh, image maintenance, uh, and this is really where we've. sort of saving Arlo's face. Rather than saying, I don't like it, it's evocative, okay? So early on, this goes back to the 80s, one of the things that we did is we looked at the production of ambiguity in terms of what's called politeness theory. This is a very popular theory uh, by Brown and Levinson, uh, and they argued that there's a universal motivation that people all, in all cultures uh, have this drive uh, to manage uh, face or, or image of, of one another. And so what we did, is this was early on, this is in the late 80s, uh, we did these cross-cultural studies looking at basically asking people how they would make a request. Uh, and we varied social variables. I was very lucky at the time I had a graduate student who was from South Korea who had been a professional translator. So it was just perfect for generating Korean versions, English versions. Uh, and so we did a series of studies uh, and interestingly we found both cultural similarities and differences. So as the theory predicts, uh, we found very similar politeness mechanisms in two very, very different languages. Uh, we also found that social variables have the same impact in both cultures, so people are more ambiguous, more polite, more indirect uh, as the status of the speaker goes up, uh, and same with distance in a relationship. And then maybe most interestingly, we also, within the same framework, we found cultural differences. So even though all, everybody speaks differently as a function of the speaker's status, people in South Korea tend to vary that more. They weight status more heavily than people in, um, uh, in, this, in, in this country do. So that was some early stuff. And, and this idea that, that language is responsive to the social context, it's really been a big part of, of stuff that I've looked at over the years. Uh, and a recent version of that, uh, this idea that language is sort of a vehicle for impression management, uh, sort of a recent version of that is the, the work we did on uh, texting and personality. Uh, the basic idea is that, that how we text, uh, like how we talk, reveals something about our personality. I don't know where this came from. Um, this, this particular, somebody did a, a piece on this and this phone was there, so I grabbed it. Um, what we did in this is we, we had participants come in, students come in, and we, we got their phones and we, had, we got their last, I think, 10 or 15 text messages. And we analyzed those text messages and we looked at them uh, in terms of uh, various sorts of linguistic categories. We had to develop uh, many new categories to capture some of the abbreviations that you see uh, in texting. And then we correlated uh, those, um, uh, those linguistic categories with a number of different personality dimensions. So here's just a couple of the findings that I think are uh, interesting. The, the one thing we found in texting that was kind of interesting because it's the opposite of what you tend to see in texting, which is everybody shortens things, right? Because you're limited, you're constrained. Uh, but there is this phenomenon where sometimes people will actually expand a word. So it was really good. And it's almost like increasing volume. Uh, and extroverts tend to be talk a lot and loudly, and they tend to do these sorts of expansions. So we found a nice correlation uh, between the occurrence of that uh, and, and degrees of extroversion. Uh, we also found correlation between uh, neuroticism and number of negative words, acronyms, um, and, and so on. Okay, I want to flip now and talk uh, about sort of the comprehension side of things. How do we comprehend? How do people comprehend um, ambiguity? And sort of the guiding, uh, the guiding factor here is, or the guiding idea here is that any factor that's involved in language production will play a parallel role in language comprehension. So one of the things we focused on in production is, is status. People talk differently as a function of the status of the, of the person that they're speaking with. And we find then, in terms of comprehension, the status plays a, a substantial role in disambiguating uh, ambiguous remarks. Uh, so a, well, a negative state remark is cold in here, uh, is going to be more likely and more quickly interpreted as a directive if the speaker is high status uh, than, than if not. And this sort of ties in with the, with, with the uh, idea of ambiguity as manipulation. So this is my Chris Christie uh, take. Wouldn't it be nice if someone could close those bridge lanes? Uh, wouldn't it be nice? Not saying do it, but because the person is high status, you get a directive interpretation. So we've done a lot of studies looking at the role of status on the comprehension process, and we find it, 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 it impacts comprehension early on. 
people are very much attuned to status, and it, it short circuits a lot of, of, of uh, uh, processing, if you know the species of high status. Okay, uh, and this is something about the last 10 or 15 years. We've, I'm going to go into a little bit of detail on this because this has gone in a lot of different directions. Uh, this is our, our research on recognizing what are called speech acts. Uh, and the idea here is that when we converse, uh, it's cognitively taxing because we, we have to process what the other person is saying, we have to think about what we're saying, and so on and so forth. So we probably don't engage in a full syntactic semantic analysis of every utterance that we encounter. Rather, uh, we engage in what, what some people refer to as good enough processing. We get a quick take uh, on, on what somebody uh, is trying to tell us. And my take on this is that one of the things that we do is we quickly and relatively automatically classify people's utterances in terms of speech acts. So speech, a or speech act verbs are things like deny, apologize, uh, threaten, uh, criticize, and so on and so forth. So we've done a lot of studies looking at this. I'm gonna, this is where I'm going to show you an example of what some of our materials look like. So if you were, a, if you were a, a subject in one of these studies, you would read something like this, okay? Or here, we sometimes have auditory material. Uh, and then I'm going to hit a button, and you're going to see an utterance. Uh, and then if you're subject, you would say when you understood it, then a word's going to come on, and you have to decide as quick as you can whether that word was in the last sentence uh, that you just read. So Emily was forgetful, Dave was sure Emily didn't remember. So don't forget to go to your dentist appointment today. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> it wasn't supposed to be that loud. Um, anyway, so remind, so what we're timing is how long it takes people to uh, verify that remind was not in that utterance, okay, because it was not there. But the logic is, okay, the logic is that when you comprehend an utterance like that, there is some automatic activation of that speech act verb. And if that's the case, you're going to be slowed a little bit when you're making that decision relative to a control trial. And, we've, and so we, that's what's called a recognition probe procedure. We've, dis, we've demonstrated that many times, and we've also demonstrated it with, um, uh, with a lexical decision uh, process. So one of the findings that's, that's really clear is that there is, um, uh, at least in non-impaired people, I'll get to that in just a second, there is an automatic activation of, of some sort of speech act category for many utterances that we, uh, and it doesn't last long. We, when we do these time delays, at, at about a second, it's gone. So these are very brief, brief bursts, uh, and don't last, no, they don't last very long. So we took this in a number of different directions. One of the, uh, one of the things that we did that I thought was, was interesting was we, um, uh, we developed a conversation bot. In, in psycholinguistics, there's a fundamental problem in that people typically study how observers process language. They're not studying how people who are actually conversing are processing language, right? Which is hard to do. So one of the ways that we tried to get at this was with uh, developing a conversation bot. This is a, a program, sort of like Siri, except it was Sam. Uh, and Sam was a Ball State student. And we would bring uh, participants in, and we would say, chat. This is about 10 years ago. Uh, and we would have them chat with, with Sam. Uh, and then we would interspace this with, every now and then, there, a word would, would pop on the screen. This is an example here. And the task was, as I showed you before, with a lexical probe, you have to say whether or not that word was in there. So don't take a class from Harmon. Uh, he's terrible. Warn the show, and let you know. And, and very nicely, we found exactly uh, what we found with, with our observer subjects. So when people are actually involved in an interaction, you get exactly the same sort of effects. So that was very, uh, very nice to see. Uh, more recently, this has gone in the direction of sort of the neural underpinnings of speech act activation. So one example of this is the work we've done on um, um, uh, uh, language deficits in, in people with Parkinson's. This is in collaboration with people at Boston University. Uh, we've, we've done uh, uh, many, uh, uh, this is a longitudinal project. We're looking at a lot of language deficits, cognitive deficits, and so on. Uh, and one of the things that we've included is the, is the speech act comprehension measure. And we find that people with Parkinson's, and this is later, towards the later stage, uh, part of like levels two and three, uh, they don't show automatic speech act activation like control participants. Again, control participants in these studies are elderly. They just don't have Parkinson's. Um, so that was pretty interesting. One of the things we're working on now, and we want to move, and our, our interpretation of the finding is that it's due to, to cognitive, uh, excuse me, executive cognitive function deficits. Um, and so it correlates highly with the Stroop and, and that sort of thing. But my hunch and, and the people I work with, um, our hunch is that's really not 
the, the thing that's really going on. We think there's some sort of pragmatic module that's sort of independent of that. And in particular, what we've been trying to get funding for this, this last idea here. We haven't uh, done it yet, but, but it's a good idea, I think. And the idea is that there is a close connection between the neural circuits involved in, in you know, producing motor actions, which obviously people with Parkinson's have problems with, and using the embodied cognition idea, those same neural circuits are involved in comprehending descriptions of those actions. So that's something we're trying to pursue. Uh, we just haven't been able to uh, get that underway yet. Um, the other neural underpinning of this is we've looked at uh, the role of the right hemisphere in comprehending speech acts. Uh, as you probably know, language is, is heavily lateralized for most people in the left hemisphere. Uh, however, uh, the right hemisphere plays a role in sort of extra meaning ambiguity. Uh, and so we've looked at the role of the right hemisphere in, in speech act comprehension. And the way we do this is the, the materials that I showed you just a little bit ago, people would, participants would read those. We would show the target, remind, would we'd lateralize it either the left or the right uh, visual field so we can tap which hemisphere is, is processing that most efficiently. And we find that the right hemisphere has a clear advantage. Uh, in terms of in terms of speech act comprehension, we think that's because right hemisphere tend the uh, the the semantic organization of the right hemisphere is a little bit different uh, than the left hemisphere. And down to the last thing. Okay, so currently, uh, what the research has focused on the last about three years now is lexical ambiguity. So rather than ambiguous sentence, sentences, um, we're studying what are called uncertainty terms. So these include things like quantifiers, uh, probability terms, uh, evaluation, uh, frequency, and, and so on and so forth. What we're, these are some of the questions we're trying to get a handle on. Uh, what variables influence how they're interpreted? Okay, so what, what guides a person to interpret some, some, one way rather than another way? Uh, what are the cognitive processes that are involved in this sort of, in this sort of process? Uh, and then lastly, is there a mismatch uh, between what a speaker intends with an uncertainty term and what a hearer uh, infers? And we're starting to get some data that, that speaks to that, to that issue because speakers may be attending to certain aspects of the context that receivers aren't. And so it's possible that you can get a mismatch, some miscommunication. And so that's one of the things we're looking at. A um, few other future directions uh, going forward. Uh, with our new EEG equipment now, uh, uh, we have a plan for looking at uh, evoked related potentials. So the idea is we just embed some of these uncertainty terms in utterances uh, and look at um, uh, neural firing as a function uh, of, of the context that they're in. Uh, so we hope to get that underway next year. Uh, do effects replicate for recipients of actual utterances? This is something that, this goes back to the bot and Sam. Uh, one of the things I really want to try to get a handle on, figure out a methodology for, is to um, uh, study how people process language when they're actually involved in some sort of verbal interaction. So we're doing things now uh, where we'll have, we'll, 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 uh, we'll run somebody through a, a reaction time experiment and then we'll say something to them, like, or we'll lie, we'll say there's some subject pool problems and some people, some people are getting extra pay. And then we'll ask, all right, what did, what did, what did we mean by some? And so we'll get data on that. But it, at this point, it's not very realistic, and so we're not really, uh, we're not really finding anything. Uh, and, then, and then the speech act, the, the Parkinson's and speech act comprehension in terms of neural circuits involved in motor and comprehension, that's something we're uh, hoping to uh, uh, push forward as well. And I think that's it. So, and yes, Lambert. I'm sorry? Can I make a general statement? No. I mean, what, what, what <laughs> like, well, I don't understand what you're getting at. So, it depends. Uh, I mean, so, some, yes, many times. Uh, if, if, if the ambiguity is, is, is novel, then it's going to require some sort of processing. I mean, we have metaphors that, or I idioms, for example, which are, you know, uh, uh, let the cat out of the bag. You know, th that, yeah, that's directly retrieved. There's not any sort of involved processing to, oh, what does he mean by that, right? So it, it depends. Novelty, I think, is one of the variables that cut, in terms of utterance ambiguity, that cuts across a lot of, uh, a lot of that stuff.
So, in, but so in, yeah, in general, it, it does require ambiguity. Requires extra, extra processing. Yeah. <laughs> I've I've thought about that. Um, I mean, there are there are some interesting. I mean, there is obviously there's language involved in gambling, uh, and I've given it some thought, uh, but I haven't come up with anything concrete yet. So it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. There probably there should be, <laughs> because it, um, I don't I can't I don't know of any I, my hunch is probably somebody has has pursued that a little bit, but I'm I'm not familiar with it. But I mean it's obviously an instance that's that's ripe uh, for misunderstanding, ambiguity, and uh, and so on. So the correlation between emoticons and what, I can't remember what I, I think I had neuroticism up there. We can't, yeah, I don't know about, um, for neuroticism, I mean, it makes, we, what we find more uh, negative emotional words, and that makes sense, like neuroticism is about, is about negative emotionality. Uh, the emoticons don't have a, I don't know, uh, I don't know. You know, except that they are they are emotionally charged things, and it's sort of part of the this overall increased or higher level of emotionality uh, for them. We also find gender. I didn't report it, but there's um, females use emoticons more than males, uh, and there's that sort of thing. But I don't really have. I'd, I'd love to hear if you have a reason uh, for why we get that correlation, but I don't. I don't have one. Yeah, Cameron. To make to make a clear, yeah, that's sure that makes perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, I think there probably is something to that. Exactly. I know. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you. So, yeah. job of the artist to put the pieces in place that allow the audience to make that, that final leap. Because what's most important is, is not telling the audience what to think, that doesn't engage people, that puts them back in their chair and puts them in a passive position. Whereas um, if you know how to use subtext, if you know how to create that third thing, this juxtaposition, you draw the audience in and they start to put the pieces together themselves. And they start to create their own meaning that exists along with and inside what you're trying to say. And I think that's one of the big things that I'm really trying to do with my writing, my screenwriting, my video poetry, my poetry, my fiction, is not so much directly translate what I am trying to say to the audience, although that's part of my intention. Uh, but I want to leave room for the audience to kind of intuit and come to their own conclusions about things. I'm wearing a wire, just want you to know we all need to watch what we say, so let's be careful. 
Um, when I started to put this thing together, I, I talked to my colleagues about my, my work spans a variety of genres and things, and I was thinking how to best coalesce this in a way that I would be able to get it across in 20 minutes. And all my colleagues said, PowerPoint, PowerPoint, PowerPoint. And ironically, I don't ever use PowerPoint. I use other kinds of technologies. And so I found myself working in PowerPoint. And this narrator, this uh, other self, which sometimes sincere, sometimes a little bit snarky, kind of emerged. And I thought, well, I'll just let that guy roll with this. And so me and that guy are going to put this forward to you right now. So I've got this scripted out. And I've tried to embed a lot of things in here. This could blow up or go wrong at, at any moment technologically. But if not, um, I'll just wing it. So here we go. So first of all, I just wanted to say how grateful I, I am to have been honored with this award. Um, it's, it's wonderful to have my creative endeavors acknowledged, and I can honestly say that coming to Ball State has changed my creative life by enabling me to pursue artistic paths and collaborations I would not have been able to pursue otherwise. And so thanks to the university at large and to everyone here who's impacted my work through their support and collaboration. I truly appreciate it. Okay, so one of the reasons I'm here today is my recently published book. It's right here. There it is. I almost brought copies in the back to sell, but I didn't, so, okay, so, um, Three Ways of the Saw, uh, which was published by Atticus Books in, 2000, in 2012. Um, however, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the book today, because I have other aspects of my work I'd like to discuss and share, specifically those areas of my work that interconnect and inform each other in terms of both my creative process and my artistic goal. Overall, my creative endeavors are both varied and intertwined. So being that you are likely already familiar with how creative writing can function as a creative endeavor, I thought I'd use this time today to discuss some of the more unique aspects of my work, or to put it simply, how one thing leads to another. I wrote Highway Code in 2008, the year before I came to Ball State. Originally, it was what can be called a piece of flash or very short fiction. It was simply writing on the page, and it ended up in my short story collection. <laughs> However, after I arrived at Ball State, before the book was published, Highway Coded began to take on a life of its own. In the fall of my first year here, my colleague Jill Crispin introduced me to Mike Pounds, a professor in the music department, who was interested in collaborating with a creative writer who could add a lyric element to one of his musical compositions. Considering the nature of the project, I thought Highway Coda, a piece centered around musicians, would be a good fit. When Mike found out I was also a musician in a former life, he suggested that in addition to my recitation of the piece, we also record my playing electric guitar, bass, and drums, which is what we did. With all this material in hand, Mike created his composition, turning what I played inside out on its ear in some truly fascinating ways. I was floored when I heard it. And once I added my recitation, I knew we had something compelling. But then Mike asked me if I would recite the piece live over his composition at the BSU Faculty Composer Symposium. And I thought, it's not very interesting for people to watch me read this piece over Mike's composition. I need to add another element, something visual, to take this collaboration to the next level. So using Mike's composition as a guide to my editing, I sat down and created the Highway Code of Video poem, which I will show you now. Let's see if it works. Highway code. Highway coda. drive southbound on a deserted two-lane highway in their rust-eaten van, and back a dismembered trap kit, 
black instrument cases stacked. Hung over, they're rattling like reverb springs, drifting on bald tires beneath the November sky's gray wash. Last night, three of the four crashed in the cocktail waitress's living room. Singer, always the charmer, got the bed. Now they thumb a joint around while Singer drives and maps the waitress's body for the others, pausing only when he notices the whitish blur just ahead in the road. Hey man, he points. Dinner. Drummer, shotgun, pulls a sharpie, adds a mark to the back of the set list they've duct taped to the dash. One more roadkill for the running tally they're keeping on this tour. Closer, they realize it's no possum, but a small white pint container of takeout Chinese sitting upright in the center of the road, lid neatly closed, even the thin metal handle raised. Singer lines up to mow it down, thinking to spray the asphalt with pork, chicken. The others lean in, anticipate the beat of the tire against the box, when what they see next sounds like this. dropping through the air, disappearing into the blank space before the van's cracked grill. The crow rising again, flashing across their windshield and pulsing away upon the flattened light with a downbeat of wings, takeout clasped by the metal handle swinging in its talons. A black note fading across the smeared page of afternoon, the coda to last night's show scored onto their brains. Okay, so that all came together rather organically. I created two versions, one with a voiceover that enables it to be screened without a live reading, and uh, the piece has met with some success. But Highway Coda would have yet another life. Upon my hire, I was awarded an Emerging Media Fellowship for, from the Center for Media Design, and due to another past life wherein I explored digital and interactive media, I decided to use the time and resources afforded by that fellowship to explore my interest in interactive literature. 
The excellent people at the CMD connected me with a young developer programmer named Derek Hall, who eventually became one of my screenwriting students. During and after his time as my student, Derek and I began to collaborate on litdigital.com, the website that now houses three of my experiments in interactive literature, all three of which began as short pieces of writing that evolved into something more. The first cap collaboration between Derek and myself was Highway Coda. We're currently working on a fourth. So let's take a brief tour of what's going on at litdigital.com. So this is the home page. It's not very crisp right now, but uh, those are the three interfaces on the side. Exquisite Corpse, I Am Not Enough, and Highway Coda. Here is Highway Coda. This is the state of Highway Coda when the user has experienced all four quadrants. When you first arrive at Highway Coda, all that's here is this. When the user interacts with that, what they would do is they would click on it, and this, te no, this text rises up, and you have uh, and that along with a musical background. And, uh, southbound on the and that happens for all four quadrants. So after the first one appears, after you interact with the first one, the second one then appears, after you interact with that one, the third one appears, after you interact with that one, the fourth one appears. Once all four quadrants have been interacted with, you then have the ability to play. So initially, I guide the user through the interface in a particular order because I want them to experience the material in a specific way. But once they've experienced it all, I want them to be able to interact with it. That's, that's the point of the interface. And so the things that they can do, they can open all these quadrants. Drum they can raise and lower the volume. They can manipulate the music in all four of the quadrants. varieties of text overlaying each other. And they can just generally play and interact. The design is driven by the thematic elements of the piece, the amplifier, the crow, the, the signature symbols that are inside the piece itself. Another one of the pieces at litdigital.com, which also began as a poem on the page, which then became a video poem, which then became an interface, is I Will Make an Exquisite Corpse, which is based on the concept, the surrealist concept of the exquisite corpse, the three partitioned uh, collaborative drawing where one person draws a section, folds the paper over, hands it to the next person, they add a section without seeing the first. They fold it over, hand it to a third person, they add a section. You end up with some pretty interesting visual, visual uh, creations that way. I think I have one. That's kind of what an exquisite corpse would look like, a three partition drawing done in that way. So I wanted to try to approximate that in some way with an interactive environment. So what you can do is you can grab all the media on this page and you can place them on various faces of these six-sided pucks, as I call them. So over on the left side, you have you can drop things into the background. This is the Exquisite Corpse video poem. But you can also drop things onto the face of the puck. Some of the images are still. Some of them are moving. Some of them have audio. You can also spin the puck. Over here's all the linguistic elements of the poem. Here are the three individual stanzas of the poem. And then here's every single line of the poem that the user can play with. But there's also a reverse button. And one of the things I, I really wanted to do today, just because I want to see what it looks like on a big screen. And I think it's kind of fun. So I'm going to take advantage of it. Let's just do this. functionality. And now you see where I'm going. All right. 
So I would have conversations with Derek, like, can I get the, you know, make things go backwards? Can I do this? Can I do that? And he's like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So we, we end up with this. So this is the exquisite corpse interface. There's a third interface here, but I won't go into that one today. So let me get back on task here. Not all my creative projects play out in this way. Sometimes the writing never leaves the page. But lately I find it's often been taking that second step and evolving into video poetry, which is a genre of literary expression I've felt compelled to explore. And I feel that it, along with my work as a screenwriter and a visual storyteller, is going to be at the forefront of my creative endeavors for some time to come. There is a camera in the back corner over there might become material, just so you know. To that end, I would like to wrap things up by showing you two of my more recent video poetry compositions. The first is Sundowning, a collaboration with an internationally renowned video poetry director, producer, Mark Nace, also known as Swoon. The second, Our Bodies, is a remix where I took previously existing footage of an Oral Roberts sermon and, like a sculptor who sees the sculpture living inside the stone, carved away until I revealed my intent a video poem in praise of rational humanism. These are both relatively short. Here, here's the first one. This is Sundowning. For you now, there is always somewhere else that somewhere else you need to be, where someone you love is. The somewhere else you crouch in, in the disheveled dark, animal, the pure. Blood, bone, breathing, born beyond what you once were. A son, a brother, a husband, a father, a grandfather, our moon in the sky. Somewhere else where what you love is, someone else sees who you once were. By shrouding you with memories, those shadows in the mist through which you look for somewhere else and someone else. Us, looking at you right now, looking for that somewhere you must be but can't find to remember. and myself. This one has been um, screened at a number of video poetry festivals here and abroad. So this is Our Bodies. Behold, our bodies. And our bodies are to be our bodies. Behold, 
constantly changing our bodies. And our bodies are to be our bodies. Behold, thy hands have stretched out the heavens and have left with the feeling that there is the possibility of the hand of man reaching up to touch various hues and shades of light our bodies. Behold, thou openest thy hands and satisfy every need, every hunger of man, manifesting his compassion, revealing his hand, which would forever symbolize his real being, the tenderness and love that he feels for humanity. For they that live by force will die by force. Behold, the clenched fist of man. It shows the recklessness of the human mind. I think we need to remember that those hands hold goodness and love and also power. Let every head be bowed. I would like to take this moment to pray a prayer with you, a sinner's prayer. Behold, our bodies and our bodies are to be our bodies, behold my hands, amen. You'll lay your hands upon your body. I'm ready to perform a miracle in your life. Expect a miracle. to hear me speak about my work. Once again, I'm truly honored to have received this award, and I look forward to continuing to be a member of Ball State's vibrant creative community. Thanks for having me. Yeah, that's an interesting question. That's the artist's landscape, that ambiguity, that subtext, as my other self there kind of mentioned in that little intro. Um, for me, it's about, I, I don't want to lead the audience by the nose, but I often want my intent to be clear. So it depends. There's, I want a certain realm of play. I want the audience to be able to come to their own conclusions. So I want a certain level of ambiguity to exist inside the piece, but I also have certain intent. And I think in, in terms of putting that subtext in there, what I really want to do is engage the audience and allow them to put the pieces together for themselves. And that's invariably going to be something that is a mixture of both my intent and their own understanding. So it's kind of a collaborative thing between the maker and the receiver. That's why I got into the interactive literature too, because I wanted to take that to the next level, whereas I present the work with my intent, like Highway Coda, for example, where you're guided through it in a certain manner, and then you're free to play. So I what you're talking about is an area that I'm really interested in, like to explore a lot. There's layers in there, I believe. Good question. John? How much of the work I mean, uh, is sound, sound objects, that is, abstract objects? Yeah. Abstract objects versus maybe neutral or, or set up spaces? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a mixture. In the pieces that, the f in Highway Coda, that was roughly half and half. Sometimes I'll pull things from the web. There's a, a, the Prelinger archives, lots of live public domain footage. That second video poem that I showed, the vast majority of that came from there. But then I started to overlay and remix. And so I, I take things from the public domain sometimes and then repurpose them for myself. So it's a mixture. Some of the other video poems that I'm working on are almost exclusively footage that I shoot myself. Uh, I will make an exquisite corpse, those 
those images of me rotating is me with quarters taped to my eyes sitting in a spinning chair with a camera on a table. You know, I, mean, I thought to myself, how do I achieve that effect of the rotating head? And that was how I came up with it. So one of the things that I think about video poetry as a genre that makes it so interesting is that there are those modes to it. I've seen some very elaborate productions, video poetry productions that involve entire crews of 15, 20 people. And then there's people that do it like I do it, which is essentially by themselves. And I think the people that tend to do it by themselves tend to go out and get footage where they can find it from, from public sources, from things they shoot on their iPhones, um, you know, things like that. So it's a mixture of both. Yeah, um, each piece is different. Sundowning is based on personal experience wrestling with, uh, in my family, Alzheimer's right now. And there's a phase in Alzheimer's called sundowning where the sufferer has the sense that they have to go home. They have to go even though they're already home. They just don't realize that. So I was exploring my feelings about that particular circumstance with that piece. The Exquisite Corpse piece is more based around the, the concept of how the, the, the name of the poem is I Will Make an Exquisite Corpse. So I'm, I'm trying to deal with the duality of both of those things there, which is I'm about to make an exquisite corpse right in front of you. Here we go, three pieces, you're going to see it happen. But the language of the poem itself is really kind of dealing with someone who is psychologically on fire and this person's burning out. And the nature of the poem itself is about someone crashing and burning. So it's kind of playing off those two things. Whereas the third piece, the Oral Roberts piece, that was just a really kind of interesting piece of serendipity. I have no idea how I followed the breadcrumb trail that led me to Oral Roberts in the first place, but I, I watched this sermon, and he's so fantastic in his gesticulations when he talks, and then the content of what he was saying really struck me, and I thought, inside there is something other than what he's saying. There's two things going on in this poem, in, in his sermon. One of them is a poem about rational humanism and praise of rational humanism. The other is his sermon. And so that, that's what brought to me the idea of the split streams and the, and the two levels. And I w it was very important to me to try to carve my meaning out of there without disrespecting his own intent. I didn't want to make him look foolish, but I wanted to kind of capture his energy. So it's different for every piece. There's a, a mixture in the ways that they relate. I kind of wander around in terms of thematic concerns. In terms of the book itself, it is divided into three sections, and each one of those sections is united by... The first by concerns of family, the second is about ne'er-do-wells, the third is about relationships. So there's a wide variety of themes that I'm trying to wrestle my way through as I figure out who I am, who we are, what's going on with all of this, you know, so. Any other questions? All right, well. I think you'll agree it was very interesting. Stuff. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. So, uh, okay, it's time to ask. How many people thought the gambling risk taking comment came from Dr. Oldgrave? Raise your hand. How many people think Dr. Mullen? Yeah. Cheap, thank you. It was indeed Dr. Oldgrave. Let's talk about that gambling. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, Brenda is over to the right, and we have refreshments. Please stay and enjoy and mingle and talk with our employees, and let's give them one more round of applause. Yeah.